tonight's second lecture in the Architectural League's um, series Towards a New Architecture, Climate Change and Design. I'm Rosalie Ginevro, the Executive Director of the League, and I'm very happy to welcome you here tonight um, as we continue to probe the questions of what changes in architectural practice, education, and culture are necessary to move the discipline to act with urgency, appropriate and effective urgency in the face of climate change. Given the immense challenges we face and the very large part that the built environment plays in producing greenhouse gases and contributing to climate change, architecture has been surprisingly slow off the mark in making tr truly significant changes. As Michelle Addington, tonight's speaker, wrote in her Dean's mes message this year, what we have not done or have not done effectively is take on our own responsibility for making a meaningful difference. Our professions may be small in number, but we carry the lion's share of responsibility for the past, present, and future state of our built environment. We can and we must do better. Michelle has spent mo much of her career working to frame and ask the right questions and to help others understand that asking the right questions and very critically examining any received assumptions, including about what the problem to be solved is, is critical to forward motion. The subtitle of her lecture tonight is, in fact, challenging the premise behind architecture's approach to climate change. Michelle Addington is currently Dean of the University of Texas at Austin School of Architecture, a position that she assumed in July 2017. Formerly at Yale, she served as Gerald Hines Chair in Sustainable Architectural Design with a simultaneous appointment in the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Earlier in her career, she had taught at the Harvard Graduate School of Design, the Technical University of Munich, Temple University, and Philadelphia University. Michelle was originally educated as a mechanical and nuclear engineer and worked for several years at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center and for DuPont before studying architecture. She received a, bat <clears throat> excuse me, a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Tulane, a Bachelor of Architecture from Temple University, um, and a Master of Design Science and Doctor of Design degrees from Harvard. Following Michelle's presentation, she'll be joined on stage by Amal Andreas, Dean of the Graduate School of Architecture Planning and Preservation at Columbia and Principal of Work AC. As Dean of a School of Architecture in a major research university, Amal, like Michelle, faces the daunting challenge of shaping a curriculum to educate architects to act in a world unlike anything we have known, and the seemingly endless possibilities for doing so in a setting with great potential for cross-disciplinary collaboration. Both are actively at work meeting that challenge and using those opportunities. And I'm sure it's going to be a fascinating conversation. So please welcome me. Please welcome me. Please, please join me in welcoming Michelle Addington. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Um, this is very meaningful for me. Uh, Rosalie perhaps remembers this, but I have been speaking at the Architectural League for about 20 years. And I'm actually gonna do a little bit of a sort of a quick history of that because it's very fundamental to the way that I'm approaching the subject today. Always, uh, and this, this is from day one, uh, studying engineering, I wanna know how things work. Uh, I don't wanna know rhetorically, I wanna know actually how things work. And through all of the work that I have done in, in the last 30 years, that has been at its very foundation. What I have found very interesting, and that's why it's been fascinating for me to go back and rethink all of the different lectures that I've given for the Architectural League, is that I've gone through many different sort of versions of thinking about what indeed is the problem, what indeed is the context. And a lot of that was shaped by the three different schools that I've spent my primary time teaching at uh, researching at, or in the case of Texas, leading. And so I'm just going to take you through a little quick, you know, path through history on this. Um, when I was at Harvard, and that's why I, I stayed on after I, I did my, my doctorate and stayed teaching there for 10 years, um, it was very much about sort of understanding the actual physics of how air moved. 
and perhaps the, the, the game changing uh, game changing task that I was given or asked to take on um, had to do with the Sistine Chapel. Uh, working on the Sistine Chapel was an opportunity of a lifetime for me. Uh, I had been working on dealing with the heat transfer through wall systems when I got this amazing call uh, from, um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember his first name, from Sherman uh, at Princeton, who was the uh, um, the director of the scientific committee of, of the Sistine Chapel, uh, who was talking about the fact that they had cleaned it for 25 years, which we, we well knew, um, a state-of-the-art HVAC system. Within a week, the walls were soiling again. And so it was a question about, you know, how do we deal with soil on the walls? And it was at that moment and working on that project and working uh, at the chapel that I began to sort of understand that actually, you can make air move at will. It's not hard to make air shift locations uh, simply by operating very discreetly within the boundary layer. So all of my work in the 14 years that I spent at Harvard very much related to this boundary layer manipulation where you could take a thin piece of glass, have it behave if it was thick insulation, where you could at will sort of shift uh, what a temperature profile might be in a space not hard, uh, not hard at all. Uh, very, very simple to do with small technologies and actually the, what you're seeing up there was all done with halogen lamps. Using halogen lamps in very particular locations could reshape a temperature profile. Um, I spent a great deal of time trying to get some traction for that, uh, trying to get a response in terms of, you know, this could radically change the way that we think about uh, heating and cooling of buildings, there's no reason to heat or cool the entire building when you can actually sort of, you know, deal with the body, you could deal with the surfaces, you could deal with all the heat generation within it in a very discreet fashion. Uh, but the pushback always was, you know, if what I was proposing in terms of technology could not deliver the same kind of conditions as a big dilution HVAC system, nobody wanted to deal with this. Uh, and so I thought that the problem then was getting people away from thinking that you needed HVAC as a dilution system, that we had to dilute everything within the space and have a homogeneous uh, temperature throughout. And I began delving into the history of why it is that we ended up with this sort of stunningly archaic technology in order to do this incredibly energy efficient system. And that's really what I was working on uh, when I left Harvard to go to Yale. And so while I was at Yale, uh, I didn't have the same type of technological resources uh, that I had at Harvard, but I had access to something quite different. I had access to the School of Forestry and Environmental Studies, and I also was involved in this really amazing program they had there, which was a joint degree program between architecture and environmental studies. And there's a couple of students here uh, from that program. I really felt very strongly uh, that for architects to make a difference in this field, having that strong education in the sciences was absolutely critical on that. Uh, but so the, the, the research began to shift based on the types of people that I was talking to. Uh, I was no longer working on boundary layer heat transfer. Instead, I was asked uh, by the chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, if I would put together a session for the 2010 uh, conference of parties, the climate change uh, talks that were taking place about building energy, building energy efficiency. In preparing for that, I read every document I could find about policy from every location that I could find, from different countries, uh, different institutions, uh, different nonprofits, uh, different agencies on that. And one of the things stunned me as I was going through report after report, and it didn't matter if I was looking at uh, you know, a policy from India or policy from Germany or policy from the US or policy from the United Nations, there was a statement that showed up in every one of those policy documents that caught me by surprise. It was this statement. It might have been worded slightly differently, but this is actually the original statement uh, that said that we could make this 30 to 50 percent energy reduction simply by applying sort of known technologies and known systems to buildings. 
uh, when I saw this, I thought to myself, I actually don't know what those are. I mean, not known, uh, certainly there were ways that we could rethink things, but I didn't know what they were. And I did what I would hope every, every student would do. I did a paper trail, and the paper trail was to hunt down what was the original source of this quote, so I could talk to the person or, or find the, the actual raw data that supported this. Um, it took a while. Most of the documents didn't source it. Uh, a few did, and they few, uh, sourced something from a few years before, which still wasn't the original one. It was only quoting something that had been written in a previous source. And it took a while to find out that it all sourced back uh, to a 1990s uh, study of 11 to 12 houses in Southern California, all done by the same builder, the same location, uh, using a set of choices that they had there. Uh, no one was disingenuous in the way that they used this research. Um, every time it was cited, a little bit of information dropped off. You know, it dropped off that it was just a dozen houses. It dropped off uh, that it was just houses. It dropped off that they were outside of LA. Uh, it dropped off that it was the same builder. Each time it went through sort of like the game of telephone, it lost something in the translation, but it became worldwide policy, which was a bit frightening to me. Worldwide policy that nobody had gone back and tracked through. And so, um, you know, a few years after that, I was sitting in a lecture at Princeton, and sure enough, it showed up again, uh, and this time by the undersecretary for the Department of Energy. Now, he lowered the numbers a little bit, but he was basically using that same source on that. Um, so two years ago, I, I shifted roles. I became dean at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I will say, most beautiful campus in this country, uh, Paul Cray, Cass Gilbert, uh, we have four amazing buildings for the School of Architecture. So I'm sorry, a little, little bit of advertisement here. Um, and of course, looking at the, the tower into the skyline of Austin, uh, which is quite remarkable. But my job there is very, very different. Uh, I'm not a scholar there anymore. I have responsibility not just for architecture as I had at Harvard and Yale, but uh, eight different programs uh, from architecture, landscape architecture, interior design, urban design, community regional planning, historic preservation, um, architectural history, uh, sustainable design, and there's always at least one that I forget that then someone will think I'm canceling the program. But it's having that kind of range of responsibility has also introduced me to a very different set of players. And the set of players that I'm working with in Texas, it's also a public university, which is important to note, the set of players now is, or we're working with have to do with the agency of the work. Um, so I roam the halls of City Hall. Um, I've worked with members of the, the Texas State Legislature, and more recently it's been Capitol Hill. Uh, it's been going to meet with the Texas Senators and the Texas Congressmen who are in Capitol Hill. Uh, throughout all of this, I'm not just doing it for the state of the school, you know, not, not simply about one might imagine you would go and meet with these individuals having to do with their support for the university. It's really about finding traction and agency for the type of research that the university is doing. Uh, we've dealt with a number of different things within Austin having to do with homelessness, affordable housing, a series of things uh, working directly with the city council and the mayor on in terms of, of uh, sort of uh, different approaches. We do a lot of scenario uh, development for them. We don't lobby. Uh, uh, we shouldn't lobby and we're prevented from lobbying. Uh, but we do meet with the constituents. Uh, we meet with all the different legislators on that. Uh, within the state, we're very actively involved, not only in dealing with Hurricane Harvey response, a sort of continued sort of situation within there, but also quite a bit dealing with uh, what we call the Texas Triangle, which is dealing with these, the four of the top 10 largest cities in the United States are now part of the Texas Triangle. Uh, that's Dallas, Houston, San Antonio, and Austin just broke uh, into the top 10, uh, knocking San Jose out of that. Uh, so understanding transportation, population, 
uh, density, the kind of growth that we're dealing with. Austin's the fastest growing city in the United States, so the stresses that we have on that region are, are really quite, quite legion on this. Uh, but we're also sort of dealing with things like questions about how the border is managed in many different types of ways. Uh, how do we get goods moving more quickly across the border at a time when security is increasing? How do we continue the types of partnerships uh, that we developed in the border region? So this is part of what my role is at the university to sort of deal with how we get our work out there, how we get agency for our work, and how our work turns into legislation. So it's not just about preparing the report that goes out. It's actually about having something enacted on it. And it's, it's something that I never thought uh, I would ever do in my life. Um, and it's perhaps the most rewarding thing I have ever done in my life on this. But coming to the point of this talk, so now you kind of get a sense of where I've come full circle uh, with a lot of this work. The question for me remains the same. You know, how do things actually work? And so coming back to uh, the, the energy data, which you all have seen uh, ad infinitum uh, from the IPCC, uh, in this case, different slice through it because it's looking at it in terms of income groups. Um, it does not matter what we say in terms of our successes. And then there's been a lot of work out there within our field, within other fields, um, sort of, and a lot of actually quite amazing work out there in our field. Um, but bottom line is uh, we haven't scratched the surface. We haven't made a dent in something that's continuing to increase. And of course, our, our great concern is the rate at which it's going to be increasing uh, in developing countries. Uh, I think one of our biggest unknowns will be what will happen in Africa. We're already seeing, we know what happened in China. Uh, we're seeing this happen in India now. And of course, Africa is gonna be our next great unknown in terms of the types of changes that we see as it moves up this scale. Um, we have not made a dent. We might have had some things that have made things marginally less bad, but we haven't made the kind of dent that we'd like to make. Uh, and yet we continue to sort of like cling on to what we think of as some single solutions or heroic solutions within it, thinking if we could just go down this path, uh, we're gonna solve things. And I'm just gonna put out there that that's not gonna happen without a lot of other things uh, beginning to change. And so in, in putting this together and also sort of in the conversations uh, that I've been having in Texas, uh, while I might have thought at Harvard that it was about people's belief in how they have to be surrounded by a particular kind of environment, um, at Yale it was sort of about very much a misunderstanding of what precedents should be and how they were going to be used. Here it's beginning to understand, because I'm much more interested in the legislation and the agency of how we make things happen, it actually falls into two areas. And the first is an accounting problem. When I think about the accounting problem, it's actually going to be in these four different ways. What we count, how we count, what is baseline within this, and where do we make the balance? How do we do an energy balance on this? Um, and a lot of this is going to stem from the 1973 oil embargo. Uh, uh, I certainly remember this very well. I'm sure there's a, a portion of you in here that remember it very well, but things changed overnight. What we don't realize is that all the systems that we use today for the way that we account for and measure energy come out of the oil embargo. Uh, so for example, uh, this particular uh, energy accounting as a policy analysis tool, which developed just a a uh, year or two after the embargo, just to read this one statement on here about input-output analysis, uh, which can be dealt with sort of like going up to larger and larger groups or larger and larger segments of industry, cannot be sort of like applied moving to smaller segments of it. Input-output analysis is the same thing as what we'd call 
you know, a conservative volume analysis, it's the way that we do an energy balance on a building is using input-output. That comes from this particular policy study, and it was something that came about in this time period, even insofar as the analysis of it was, is it's actually not a good tool to use for something other than large industry and, and conglomerations of large industry. But there's a second piece of this that's actually quite important. And it has to do with the study of minerals. Uh, those of you who were alive back then uh, probably remember that it wasn't just about uh, the oil embargo in terms of the concern about the availability of gasoline. It actually was a growing concern that we did not have adequate stocks of many of the most critical minerals that we needed. And so in this particular study uh, that we had of minerals, uh, it came about that you started to realize that there was a concern for ownership and a concern for sovereignty uh, and sort of documenting where these things were located, who owned them. So the entire process that we use for doing energy analysis and the way this type of energy accounting, the primary way of energy accounting, is based on two things, ownership and where dollars are exchanged. So instead of looking at a normal energy balance, which would be about where energy conversions take place, this is about where dollars are exchanged for certain things, which is why it looks like this. Uh, so you'll see as you go down, these are the things that you purchase, you know, whether it's uh, nuclear, hydro, you know, coming all the way down, but that's sort of like the idea of sort of the purchasing. And then, of course, they get charged to where the cash, primary cash is exchanged for the actual raw material, the raw energy itself on that. So you'll notice for residential and commercial, really the only things going directly in there are actually fossil fuels. Electricity gets accounted for someplace else. So it's not really sort of like, it's indicating how much electricity might be going in there, but that primary box for electricity is located someplace else. There's a lot of other things that are completely missing there. So one of the things that we see happening within this is you start to privilege just that moment. It privileges a meter. It privileges the moment in which you pay for a particular kind of energy source, not even all of the energy that you use on this. And of course, you can see this in this as well. Buildings are the dark blue. Looks like a small portion of this. Uh, but electricity is the yellow. Buildings are about 75% of that but buildings actually show up in other segments there as well. But this shows exactly where the cash is paid. So who owns the raw materials? Where is cash paid for doing that? And the result is, is because it heavily privileges that, means it's always privileged oil, direct sort of purchases of oil and natural gas, which means residential home heating. So we've had a couple of decades where residential home heating and the response for that has actually sort of superseded a lot of our other discussions about energy because that has been the one thing that we had the accounting for and the one thing that we dealt with. And you'll see this throughout. Uh, this is from McKenzie. It's all about insulation. Um, insulation is something, and this is a whole other type of lecture, not that meaningful. Uh, not that meaningful unless you're in um, a climate that has an extreme delta T or extreme temperature difference, which really doesn't apply to that much of this country and, and certainly doesn't apply to much of the fastest growing uh, uh, urban areas that we have in the world. Um, but it ends up being overprivileged as a response because it does directly determine oil and gas use for home heating. Not, of course, for cooling, but for home heating on that. And that's also why, if you look at the Department of Energy's insulation map, um, I live in a, a two zone uh, down there in Texas. Uh, we are now expected to have insulation at a rate that only 15 years ago was considered the insulation you would use in Maine. They've moved that down because, again, that sort of sense of privileging of insulation, which comes from a privileging of um, of uh, oil and gas used for home heating still sort of like controls a lot of the way that these decisions are made. 
So if we come back to this and actually sort of look at this particular chart, um, you know, what we know is this, of course, is operational energy in here. About 75% of that goes into this as well. What's interesting because of the way that we dealt with minerals is that building materials are here. All of the energy that goes into building materials is counted to the industrial sector. Uh, and if you take the fact that the industrial sector also includes buildings within it, that's a little more than 50% of the industrial sector. We come down to transportation where we're going to deal also with construction and demolition processes. We'll have some direct cost there, but as you well know, the way we build is also responsible, you know, maybe not sort of from a causal standpoint, but it's going to be deterministically responsible for a large part of that. So we often talk about how much buildings contribute in many ways. We're only doing our energy balance here. We're not actually doing it all the way through here. It's a tremendous amount that we are actually responsible for. Um, not too many years ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change finally sort of picked up on this and, and really sounded the alarm bell on this in their fifth assessment report. Uh, they added a chapter dealing with the urban environment. And one of the things that this chapter picked up, and it's a little hard to sort of read from this, but this is looking at the embodied energy uh, that's sort of maintained in terms of the building stock on this. Um, this, again, not really being paid attention to in the same way because it was all charged the industrial sector, so not something that we dealt with uh, nearly as much. And, and I, I just have to make a quick shout out to, to David Benjamin, who I see in the audience. Uh, some of this was uh, uh, a conference, comes from a conference that he did, and I started pulling out these documents for this conference, so it kind of relates to it, and I, and I appreciate the opportunity to have spoken in that, but he's done a tremendous amount of work on looking at embodied energy. Uh, but the upshot of this is that the estimates are is that if we think about construction and all of the things that are associated with construction uh, that we have, uh, we're looking at by 2040, 30% uh, of carbon emissions will just come from the construction industry alone, mostly from its use of concrete there. Uh, no one was taking that into account when they were projecting building energy use. So we're seeing uh, even apart if we're starting to grapple with pieces of it, we now have this large unknown and, and large amount uh, also coming on our shoulders. But another part of, you know, thinking about, that's all about, you know, what we account for and, you know, the fact that we're only accounting for a small piece of what we're responsible for. It's also how we account. Uh, what's been fascinating to me is that we use energy per square foot. It makes a lot of sense in construction to use cost intensity, cost per square foot. That's a direct relationship to the types of materials that you're bringing in, the types of materials that you're moving, and you can correlate cost per square foot to labor on that. Um, the fact that we would use the same intensity thing for energy makes no sense. It doesn't make any sense at all that we do BTU per square feet or kilowatt hours per square feet or carbon dioxide per square feet. It's just lifting one type of analysis from an unrelated field and bring it into the other and sort of continuing on that. And this is sort of some of the problems that I've, I've noted for years and, and, and continue to note. You know, buildings are becoming larger and have been coming larger in square meters per capita and per function. One good thing is that we're finally starting to see residentially, uh, but at the high end, uh, which was single family homes, that's starting to flatten out. But it continued to increase uh, substantially uh, for, for many years, even sort of continued to increase after the, the last recession, and now it started to, to finally stabilize a little bit. But here's the problem with this. Every increase in dimension, if I sort of extend this out a foot, uh, of course it picks up materials by the square. It picks up ambient systems by the cube. Uh, HVAC systems because they're volumetric. Lighting systems, it depends, but often our increase in dimension is ceiling height. If you raise the height of the ceiling, it picks up lighting 
uh, by the cube, but a lot of it depends upon uh, function and occupancy density. At the same time, making a building larger means that the non-building determined loads that depend on occupancy appear less. Um, I'm taking things like uh, if I'm spreading 100 people out over a larger area and each person has their own computer, that sort of average load goes down. So what happens is that the total energy use of the building is still going up, but the way we measure energy intensity per square foot goes down because I'm spreading things out over a larger and larger area. And of course, if we're looking about what's happening worldwide, even though this might be something that we have settled out somewhat on the high end, uh, as we're seeing dramatic increases in uh, the, the size of buildings. Uh, in China, uh, when I first started looking at this, uh, we were looking at the government mandate to get things from four square meters per person up to 20 square meters per person in 2026 square meters per person, now 40.8 uh, square meters per person, a stunning increase in size uh, per person in China. India is the next one that's really beginning to take off. Uh, you know, in Mumbai right now, the average living space is just nine square meters. Uh, we will expect it to start moving, maybe not reaching the point of China, but start moving in that point of China. Uh, what you see on the left is Gurgaon, uh, which is a suburb of Delhi. Uh, the one that you see on the right is actually new housing going up outside of Cairo. Uh, this is going to be something that not well predicted the rate at which things are increasing. But the problem with the energy intensity is that if we just look at energy per square foot, we're kind of fooling ourselves into thinking that we're making a difference when all we're really doing is spreading a lot of the load out over a larger area. The best way to make a building look energy efficient is to, to put an atrium in it. Anything that gets rid of people in a building will make that building look better on a square foot, uh, energy per square foot basis, even in so far as to treat to sort of deal with the energy of those people, you're still having to expend it. So a number of years ago while I was at Yale, I worked with a researcher in electrical engineering and we did some very deep monitoring um, of a fairly typical office building, or, uh, educational building there. Uh, it was an amazing, uh, amazing collaborator who had developed a way of monitoring every single plug load, and I don't mean on a plug by plug basis, but on an equipment by equipment basis. We knew when somebody was turning on a coffee maker, we knew when someone was plugging in a cell phone to charge. We had that kind of micro data about how people were using a building. And we developed this four part metric that we tried to get out there, saying this would be a more accurate way of looking at how a building performed. Uh, stripping out the occupant loads. Now, how much is this really about occupant behavior? It's not really about the way you design a building, but the occupant brings an awful lot of loads along with him or her. Uh, technology determined loads, this is where we thought subsidies should go in ways of sort of dealing with the upgrading of technology. Uh, always it seemed unfair that uh, wealthier projects wealthier re renovations, wealthier institutions could afford higher efficiency equipment, uh, poor institutions could not, um, and the way to sort of target them was actually to sort of pull those out, look at those separately. Uh, building determined loads, how we think about a space like this, which is in an entirely internal in terms of dealing with it thermally, dealing with the light, and then envelope loads. And of course, the startling thing about this, and granted, I can't say that it's generalizable, although um, I've, I feel like it's relatively generalizable, certainly at that kind of, for a scale, a large scale of a building as opposed to a small home, was that the load that was least significant was actually the envelope, uh, that the other loads actually far stripped out the envelope, yet almost all of our intention goes to the envelope, which ties back to its original privileging from oil and gas and from heating on this. We want it to be the envelope. We really focus on the envelope. The way we do our balance is all about that. <laughs>
we think about sort of like what is baseline, this has also been something quite difficult for us. Um, and for those of you, and I imagine most of you here are, you know, in the business, um, we are, we hear numbers daily. This saved 10%, this is 20% more efficient. We hear these constantly in terms of how much energy something is saving, how, how much more efficient something is. What is that being compared to? Um, this is Rudolf Hall uh, back at Yale. It had a, uh, an exhaustive uh, renovation uh, that most people are happy with most of it. Um, and and th those of you who are familiar with the building will, will, will know what I mean by that. Um, and, uh, you know, an energy efficient re uh, renovation, uh, some uh, significant features were added to improve its energy efficiency. This is the actual data uh, after the renovation. Uh, and so you can see when the building went down in 2007, came back up again uh, after a year, actually a very quick renovation, and its energy use came close to doubling. Uh, that doesn't mean that it actually wasn't an energy efficient renovation. What it means is that the building didn't have air conditioning before it shut down. So it has air conditioning when it comes back, but it's not reported as being something that uses twice as much energy. It's reported as something that saves, I think, about 15 to 20% energy. It saves that based on the energy model of a building that had air conditioning, not on what it actually used. And it's not that it's not doing a much better job of maintaining things with, uh, or much better performing job, um, that it is, but it is using a lot more energy. So when people are thinking that the building is using 20% less energy, they're thinking it uses 20% less energy, not 20% less energy than the energy model said it would have used if it had been built a different way. Um, and as long as we're sort of operating with the sort of slippery location of what we're comparing against, we don't really have good information uh, to work with on this. We need to know both. We need to know that the features actually made a difference in the building, but we also need to know that we're continuing to add along there. So the other piece of this is a sort of where we draw our boundary. One of the things that we, we've tended to do is draw a boundary around things. Uh, we talk about green products. Uh, we talk about green buildings. Uh, Santa Monica talks about a green city uh, in this. We like to draw our boundary uh, in plan in many cases or around an object uh, and many others. Uh, and then do an energy analysis around that. That's not how energy moves. Uh, energy doesn't move based on private property. It doesn't move based on a way that you sort of define just this thing uh, in, in some type of isolated world from anything else. Uh, if you think about the classic way that we draw a thermodynamic system, the problem with that is that it conceptually looks like a building. And so people assume that a thermodynamic system actually is a building. And it's one of the reasons why we do continue to think we can sort of like draw something around the edge of the building, add everything up at that boundary, and that's a meaningful sort of understanding of energy. Uh, if I wanted to sort of show what a meaning, and this is actually not showing it, it actually is a meaningful exchange of energy or how energy actually moves in exchange, this is perhaps the best view of that. It's transient, um, it's not ever attached to location, so the idea that an energy exchange would be attached to a physical location actually defies the entire idea of what energy is. We wanted to do a real energy analysis it's gonna be the hard way. It's gonna be the hard way of sort of looking at all of the interacting types of relationships uh, that we have to deal with. Um, how do we get from sort of looking at a building uh, to looking at the entire atmosphere? That's a hard task. But as long as we're only looking at the building, we're not sort of, or looking at a, a, a jurisdiction or looking at a city, we're actually not doing the analyses that really matter on this. The other part um, that I've only recently begun to recognize because of different conversations uh, that I've had when I, when I speak to um, 
different in individuals and in policy on this um, has to do with the stabilization wedge. I, I don't know how many people in here are familiar with stabilization wedge uh, theory or the process on that, uh, but this was proposed by Rob Sokolaw uh, at Princeton a number of years ago. Uh, the idea that if you sort of look at where we needed to be versus where we were going, took out that large wedge, and then started slicing up that wedge into discrete bits, uh, that you could actually pull out one bit and say, if I work on that one bit or that one wedge, I'm going to make this much of a difference in reducing, um, you know, um, or reducing our path toward, uh, reducing our path toward, um, you know, uh, uh, raising temperature on this. And this is really sort of uh, kind of the lingua franca of many people who are working on uh, energy and particularly energy in uh, the, the uh, industrial sector and in the building sector has to do with these climate wedges. Uh, this was some years later, thinking like it isn't just dealing with that wedge because we've continued to go up since that first wedge was shown. Now we actually have to have additional wedges in there to take out more and more pieces of it. What's called hidden wedges are in there where the things that they didn't even know back then, which the fact that substituting natural gas uh, for coal automatically uh, reduces uh, some of the carbon content, so there was some hope for that. But the idea is, is that if I could just pick these different things, develop policy and develop action around that, a uh, difference is going to be made on that. Uh, and there's a series of problems with the stabilization wedge theory. The first is that it heavily overprivileges like single actor solutions or single ticket solutions. And these are the three that have the most impact on architecture, decarbonization, net zero energy and density. Sort of these three sort of things in there. Uh, there's many others in there as well, but these are the three that I just sort of want to quickly talk a little bit about. Um, if we think about sort of uh, decarbonizing uh, particular energy sources, one of the problems that we have is that we violate, we tend, that our choices tend to violate the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, we tend to go for those sort of re replacements that are on the lower end of the scale. It's not what nature wants to do. And one of the difficulties with focusing on the lower half of this is that we're actually creating or, or, or contributing to, not in a good way, our radiant emissions from the Earth. So we pick up, anytime we violate the second law, we actually increase radiant emissions. So we might be sort of like doing something for reducing greenhouse gases up here, but now we're also sending more energy up to the ones uh, that are still there. That's not really a good trade. So when the focus is only about removing carbon, we're not thinking about all the other consequences of the things that we're doing. Uh, the other one in here violates the third law. Uh, it has to do with exergy. Uh, we have a tendency when we look at all of our building needs and we think about the energy needs out there, uh, particularly as we focused on net zero energy, we have gone for the highest exergy, uh, sort of like the highest quality energy we can think about. We worry about making electricity. And we work, make electricity uh, primarily, as we've talked about in many ways, with photovoltaics and certain things like that, low carbon, uh, but using other kinds of, uh, using uh, 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 sort of, you know, uh, things that violate second law of thermodynamics. Now we're using it here to violate the third law uh, of thermodynamics, which is having to do with the quality of energy. We tend to go for the highest quality of energy because it does everything. Alternating current high quality energy is like the universal donor in blood. You can use that, you can downgrade a high quality energy to use for everything. And if you think about downgrading and what each of these can do in terms of downgrading, uh, what you realize is that ground coupling is sitting there right at the bottom. Lowest quality of energy, least organized, can do the least for you. Um, what exergy principles would have you do is work your way up. <laughs> work your way up through these using the things at the bottom first. Instead, we have a tendency to think it's a lot easier if I just deal with one energy source and downgrade it for all of our, our needs. So we've also been caught 
on this in terms of our desire to decarbonize and go net zero energy, we're actually sort of creating thermodynamic problems for ourselves because we've kind of single-mindedly looked at the types of substitutions that would best fit in with business as usual uh, for the way we do things. The other one is trickier. Um, density, and I think that uh, almost all of us live in cities or can understand uh, what's happening in cities that want increased density. Uh, there is this great graph that has influenced uh, probably 20 years uh, worth of, of legislation on this. It's a sort of very tight relationship between urban density and transportation energy. It's probably the most cited, uh, cited graph and cited work um, within the field of, of transportation energy is this particular graph. Uh, this is what's led to sort of like the desire to increase density or in the, in this, uh, for us in Austin, Texas, new legislation that came out on increasing density in the city. Um, it's causally related in some cases to energy, deterministically related in some cases, correlates in some cases, but also has as well uh, an attendant set of issues with it. Uh, this is one of the issues that we have, is that if you look at where counties are in Texas, and you look at where water is, uh, in terms of sort of dealing with the type of growth that we have in our urban areas, uh, if each individual jurisdiction is thinking about growth or density to support that, it's not thinking about the impact that's going to have on our water resources. Uh, we're predicted to run out of water uh, in Texas, drinking water in Texas uh, within my lifetime on this. And part of it has to do with the sort of increasing urban concentration uh, that's taking place in this Texas triangle. If I just show you an image of Austin, one of the things you're gonna notice in this image is there's these lines coming out in Austin. This is sort of the dense part of Austin. By the way, this is campus. It has uh, red tile roofs. So actually even see it in this aerial view here. Uh, but these types of, of uh, strips, which are just sort of the beginning of the way that the city is building and densifying beyond. And I'm gonna focus right here on this particular strip, um, uh, East 5th and East uh, 6th Street uh, that you're looking at. That's one of those, there's another one here at 11th Street. Um, the neighborhood which was low density is being replaced by higher density mixed use. This is what it looks like. Uh, I photograph every week um, as another neighborhood is raised and another one of these that are known as five over ones uh, comes up uh, along this street. They hit all the marks that people want to hear. Uh, they're obviously much higher density than the single family homes that they're replacing. Uh, they're mixed use, uh, so that, that's a check uh, that everybody wants to hear. Uh, supposedly uh, walkable, but um, as you know, no one actually walks in Texas. However, we do scooter. Uh, everywhere, so we we do we do micro mobility, uh, but there's not a whole lot of walking when it's 105 high, five degrees outside. But this is what it's replacing. Uh, what's really interesting about this push to have this higher density is that the average home that was in a lot of these neighborhoods in East Austin, no more than 800 square feet. The energy use per capita has gone up in these new constructions. So we're going to apartments, almost all these are, are sort of filled with apartments. They use more energy per person. They use that less energy per square foot, but they use more energy per person uh, within these than what they're replacing. Uh, they're eliminating sort of the, the green ground cover that was there. East Austin was very, very green. Uh, so we're affecting uh, our albedo, we're affecting our radiant exchange by losing all of that green ground cover. But one of the biggest parts, one of the biggest problems is that it's actually moving a poor community 
further and further away. Um, this was an interesting map that I found looking at life expectancy uh, in Austin. This is a stunning range. You know, you, you don't normally see a range from 60 to 90 uh, in a single city, much less in the developed world would you see that. But this sort of line right here from uh, west, which is wealthy, to east, which was always low income. Uh, this used to be an African-American community. Uh, it's a Latino community now. And what's happening is they're moving further and further in this direction. And so what you have is not only sort of the moving further and further in this direction as apartments primarily for tech bros, 30-something uh, tech bros, they're sort of like remaking that part of the city. On paper, it's exactly what the city is supposed to be doing. High density, walkable, supposedly uh, uh, multi-use, uh, no more single family. But what it's doing on the other end of it actually has real consequences. And so this really takes me back to sort of where I want to close with. Um, and it has to do with the original definition of sustainability. Uh, which came from our common future. Uh, how did, that was the report of the Brundtland Commission in 1987. This is where sustainable development was first defined. And here the, the words sound familiar to us. Sustainable development seeks to meet the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. Very much like the sort of first thing that I showed you where every time something got repeated, uh, had to do with uh, the 11 to 12 homes in Southern California. Every time something got repeated, information got dropped off. This is a case that every time this got repeated, uh, the context was lost on that. Uh, the context for this was never about sort of like a sustainable product. It was never about thinking about my children as opposed to anybody else's children. It was thinking about the planet as a whole that what we do in this country has incredible impacts on people in other parts of the world, that people in other parts of the world have the right to a better life. Uh, so when we're talking about future generations, we're talking about generations not of our own, but those that we collectively share this planet with. While the Brundtland Commission was working on this and assembling data, this is what they were looking at in terms of environmental issues, the sort of this incredible range on environmental issues. At the same time, they were looking at an incredible range of developmental issues. Their idea of sustainability was how do we address these developmental issues, knowing that countries that are developing will tend to go through an industrial cycle that will increase a lot of environmental consequences. So how do those of us in the developed world sort of take on the lion's share of reducing environmental risks in order to enable those in the developing world to have a better life uh, within, uh, you know, with, within this world on this? Never about how do I make things better for my town, uh, my house, my product, or my children, but how do we do this for those who need? Um, on the 20th anniversary of the Brundtland Commission coming out, I invited uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland to speak, actually keynote a symposium that I organized. And it was a fascinating thing. And I, I'm, some of you may have been at that symposium that took place. Um, it was remarkable to hear her. Uh, one of the things that was kind of fascinating at the end uh, was that she was peppered with questions from the audience about things like, you know, if we could just geoengineer the upper atmosphere, solved. Uh, if we could just go ahead and restart the nuclear power program, solved. So they all wanted to hear how a heroic solution was going to solve all this. And this was her response to that. And it's, it's a response that I find um, really meaningful. Uh, she talks about the fact that sustainable development was not actually something you could achieve. Uh, but it was about something that you continued to strive for achieving, knowing that it could not ever be achieved, uh, certainly not under any kind of reasonable scenario. What she talked about was that everything that we did, 
would be about difficult decisions with always problematic consequences, that there was not going to be that sort of singular solution that would jump out um, that was not going to have consequences. And that true sustainability was understanding that as you dealt with that, you made a decision each way along the way, and what you hoped was that every decision you made, the consequences were not as bad as sort of the set of decisions you had before, but there were always going to be problematic consequences. The path forward meant taking responsibility for mitigating those as much as you can, weighing all of those consequences as much as you can. Um, I said she's a, a, a role model and a hero of mine, um, inspired me incredibly, uh, and it's why um, I continue to work in this field. It, it, it means a lot to me. Uh, what I do want to leave with is not sort of a pessimistic idea about how we move forward, uh, but actually more of a charge that we step back from sort of like so quickly jumping on solutions to actually more sort of thoughtfully peeling back and asking ourselves deeper questions. That we start asking uh, for additional types of collaboration and work to help us understand different types of consequences. I think the parts that would be most important for us to be thinking about are sort of not how we can continue to find ways to continue to do what we're already doing. Uh, this is not a question of trying to substitute one building material for another, find a different energy source to keep you know, moving along in the way that we're moving along and use the same technologies, but a serious questioning of every decision that we make in the building process, every decision that we make that ends up involving the sort of the whole phalanx of different types of impacts of different types of consequences that we deal with. I actually think it's an exciting time to be in our field right now. Never have the challenges been greater, uh, never has the responsibility been heavier than us. But we have got to start stepping up and realizing that we cannot continue to build in the way that we've been building. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michelle, for this uh, incredible lecture. Kind of, I'm trying to connect the dots, but of course it's impossible. Um, and I think that's sort of the point. Um, it was kind of really interesting to hear you trace, you know, your own trajectory and the importance of, um, I mean, kind of collaboration, cross-disciplinary work in every institution. Uh, you yourself are an engineer and an architect and kind of weaving these um, these kind of expertise um, together. Um, uh, and the sort of importance of uh, continuing to question, engage the sciences, but also the sense, and I think this is a very much, uh, I mean, I feel it as, as dean, as educator, as architect, there's so much noise. Um, and, you know, we keep, you know, I keep saying, um, or we keep saying, but we don't. We don't really know. We're very aware that we we, we just don't have the um, the metrics. You mentioned the embodied energy conference. I think that was a really interesting moment to realize that um, you know it's not static. You can't measure things at a certain time. You have to take the whole story, um, the whole life cycle, and and how to measure, how to frame. Where does the boundary lie? At what scale do we frame the problem? I mean, these are all really architectural questions. Um, um, and um, I think that uh, it's, it was interesting for me to think about, you know, again, as an educator, as dean, how do we also reframe the disciplines and their practices, right? I mean, we, you can name all of the programs or, you know, under, I mean, I know you can, but, uh, you know, for me, it's been it's been the same. How do we, you know, these disciplines that have fragmented uh, at a certain time, architecture, planning, preservation, why are these boundaries, real estate development, why are these boundaries there and not cast um, in, in another way? Why are there, 
what is the relationship today between engineering and architecture? And um, and I think it's it's also at that level of you know fundamental transformation that we need to operate in terms of the of the recasting those disciplines around maybe questions or um, but but we have that history that keeps pulling you know in practice we have this is the way we've done things and then in in academia we have the history of the disciplines that are constantly you know pulling us back um, and so obviously the you know, at some point, the, the questioning and the probing it becomes almost overwhelming. Uh, uh, and um, but at the same time, I think again, the way you conclude it is, but this is what we're supposed to do as architects, right? We 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 ask questions about a program. We ask. We recast it. We don't just serve a solution. Um, and we're constantly designing in this kind of state of uncertainty. Um, and this is a, you know, but. But somehow, when it comes to sustainability or technology, we think, no, no, this is stable, this is knowable. Um, and so I think embracing this sense of design with uncertainty and, and this, this flux, I was very interested to hear more about um, this excitement you are feeling in engaging policy and legislation and how, how, um, how you're operating to convince you know, despite the uncertainty, to kind of put a set, you know, a foot forward. How do, how as an architect, um, you 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 kind of make a case for where to draw the line, or you know, how you're building that um, sort of um, that level of engagement and action. Right? I, that that that's kind of where I wanted to maybe start the conversation to hear more about that. Well, this has been something that I I honestly never thought I would ever do, uh, which would be to uh, step into Ted Cruz's uh, Senate offices uh, to, to talk about uh, energy. And, uh, and this, I, I'll have to credit, actually, uh, Yale with this. While I was at Yale, I heard an amazing lecture by a, um, a psychologist named Dan Kahane who talked about uh, the fact that uh, it was talking about uh, cultural cognition and that depending upon what it is that people deeply believe, they have a tendency to cherry pick information in order to support that. So as educators, we've always believed that as long as we taught uh, and, and continued uh, to provide new information and new ideas, people would start moving, they'd converge. Uh, they'd start moving more toward a, a, an agreed upon sort of set of responses that, that we'd be expecting for that. And Dan Kahane sort of threw that out in saying that depended. It depended upon whether or not something struck chord with you, maybe politically, maybe morally, maybe uh, spiritually, uh, that if it did sort of like turn that switch, you actually would cherry pick information in such a way that the more you were educated, uh, the more people would diverge on a topic rather than converge. And so uh, for me, I, I go into each one of these offices uh, thinking about what's the neutral ground on which to begin the conversation. Uh, if I, and, and part of doing that is not just to get them to move in a particular direction, it's also so that I can hear what it is that they had to say. And so in, in Ted Cruz's office, it was talking about um, security, uh, uh, actually defense. Uh, we have a, believe it or not, at the School of Architecture, we have a NATO grant. Uh, our NATO grant is because this is something architects can do that others can't. Uh, large, complex, uh, three-dimensional models of urban environments where we can look at things uh, not just in terms of terrorism, but also uh, for NATO, it includes climate change, the impacts of climate change on cities and the stresses on cities for that, unexpected weather, uh, as well as social unrest. So these are part of the things that we can model in a way uh, nobody else can model. And it's sort of a quick aside, uh, University of Texas has the largest academic supercomputer in the world, and the School of Architecture is one of the biggest users of that supercomputer, mostly for these kind of complex modeling. Uh, 
Um, but it started on, on talking about defense, and it moved uh, to talking about um, Houston and what is Houston going to do because Houston's going to continue to flood. And it was really interesting to sort of talk about, uh, you know, what kinds of things should we be considering for our coastline on that. Um, in, in Will Hurd's office, it was about, the concern was about, uh, it started on security on the border, but then his concern is we actually need more goods and more people moving. So how do you have high security and have more goods moving? So a lot of these conversations one has to go into sort of ready to hear, ready to listen, and not so ready to have to convince for a particular thing. Because each one of those conversations, I also learned something that I didn't know about a particular situation or a particular need on that. Um, it's the most rewarding thing that I've ever done, is, is to go into offices, uh, and I'm, I'm not going to share my politics, but w regardless of, of what I believed one way or another, um, and, and to find a way to have a conversation about what really matters uh, for us in, in the built environment. It, it's very interesting because we, uh, we're also realizing that, uh, you know, part of the big issue is, is may, maybe more so than not knowing um, or not being able to measure is, is not being able to communicate, right? So you're, you mentioned, uh, or, or the sense that, that somehow we're, we're kind of not speaking to each other. Um, and you mentioned, you know, in parallel, the modeling that we do as architects, and we have this capacity to integrate and to visualize and to, um, to run scenarios, and then the human capacity to listen. And um, do, do, you, do you feel that this is uh, on, on both uh, sort of, uh, in both aspects, something that architects and architecture should engage more in, this kind of modeling, visualizing, scenario building as a, as a means to, to kind of communicate or, or, or sort of start to open up these conversations? Uh, I, I, I can't say that I would suggest that that what's, is what the field has to define itself as, uh, but it has been a very effective way for us to translating what it is that we're thinking about, what it is that we're researching into action. Uh, the scenarios themselves are the ones that speak to the, the greatest number of the public and have been incredibly effective in talking to legislators. That's, um, that's really interesting because, you know, drawing, I mean, it's so disciplinary, you know, um, at the same time. But it's also interesting that, you know, in the same way that you are mobilizing, I think, you know, at Columbia, certainly there's a sense that finally, I don't mean to say finally because James Hansen already, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, was um, sort of speaking to Congress in the 80s, but there is a sense that scientists also realize, well, that this is not just objective truth. We need to, this sense, we need to communicate, we need to convince, we need to tell stories. And uh, so this is also kind of transformation that we may be seeing in terms of the um, disciplines and, and practices. Um, but it's also interesting, you're, you're moving into policy and, uh, not moving, but you're engaging at that level. Have, do you, are you finding that there is also a need, I mean, what about institutions such as the AIA or, you know, the, the, the ones that we would think should be leading in that, uh, you know, sense of questioning and, and pushing legislation? I mean, do you feel like there is real motion on? on? I, I think that we, we've been talking quite a bit about uh, sort of two levels, sort of a horizontal level and a vertical level of engagement. Uh, one of the problems that we have, whether we're talking an architecture firm or we're talking an architecture school, is that each one of us is tiny. You know, we, we don't have critical mass. Uh, what would it take to have the right kind of critical mass? And some of the critical mass, particularly in research, is going to have to be across multiple universities. You know, each university bringing in its skills to bear. We don't all have to sort of repeat each other. Uh, we don't all have to compete for certain kinds of grants. Uh, we should be thinking about what would be a critical mass across uh, universities on this. At the same time, when it comes to actually making things happen, that's sort of your vertical 
slice through? Who are your partners? Who do you communicate with um, all the way down to the community organizer that you're dealing with, the different types of legislators you might be dealing with, the different nonprofits that may, might be working, the different types of firms out there that might be involved? How do we, do we then also sort of like orchestrate the deep dive from what it is um, that we're researching all the way to uh, all the way to implementation on it. So I really think we have to look at those in both of those kinds of fashions. And I would hope that uh, from a scholastic standpoint, we would like for ACSA and organizations like that to help us, certainly in trying to orchestrate the, the vertical motion, it would be fantastic uh, for AIA and other kinds of, of uh, entities like that to begin to orchestrate what is that deep dive critical mass. Um, I have to say, I, every day I have the sense we are so small. Architecture, you know. We are small. We are so small, and then do we really belong in the university? And are we part of the future of universities is also, you know, a question. And um, it's interesting. On the one hand, you know, the kinds of conversations you might have with a Teddy Cruz. On the other, um, you know. Well, that's my, actually a different, different than that Teddy. <laughs> oh, oh, different. Okay, okay, okay. Well, I was seeing you in that, <laughs> but uh, that, that Teddy Cruz is, is is you can you can go there. Okay, um, but um, you know, there's this other side. You know, I, I find as as an you know in a, leading an architecture school, hearing um, let's say the engineering school say, but we have it. You know, we have the solution. We you know this and and we who um, still teach history kind of turn around and say, but we've been there, you know, uh, and, and but, but we're, you know, we're not, it's very hard to, to be heard, um, but we have to try, I think is what you're saying. So I want to make sure to give some time for questions in, in the audience, um, but certainly I think the notion that we have to reorganize ourselves in different ways uh, across disciplines, across schools um, and universities, I think, makes a lot of sense and is very difficult, as we know as well. It is really difficult. And I, I just to sort of follow up a little bit on that, um, we do have, and, and, and this is sort of a, a question that's larger uh, than us, there's a, some very large gaps uh, within this field. Um, I'm a, uh, you know, besides the, the nuclear engineering that I studied, I'm, I'm really a very traditional mechanical engineer, and there's actually very few uh, you know, heat transfer, fluid mechanics, mechanical engineers working on buildings. It's actually a big gap in terms of research that's not being very well filled. Um, and there's several others of, of these types of gaps. And we often just don't know what we don't know or what we haven't heard of before. And we try to sort of like sort of construct across us or assume that chasm uh, is actually just a tiny crack when indeed it's, it's uh, actually sort of in, uh, impacting the entire foundation of a lot of the discussions. I think that's true for a lot of aspects within this. And I think that as we try to move forward, really a mapping out there of what our territory is, where those gaps are, because we're going to have to reach out and start helping construct that. Um, you know, within within the engineering world, which I, I, I do spend half of my time in, uh, you, there's a sense that, um, there, there's a sense that certain things are already figured out and they're just working to optimize. Uh, so much more work happening to optimize uh, conventional HVAC control systems, uh, probably orders of magnitude more than there are to actually rethink uh, the f how we're even doing this. Uh, and, th and this is where they're waiting for us to tell them what to do. We're waiting for them to come up with a better solution. We don't have the right kind of population in terms of being able to orchestrate what those kinds of conversations are as well. If you think uh, talking in, in Capitol Hill is tough, figuring out how to orchestrate some of those conversations I think are our biggest challenge. Should we open it up?
<clears throat> Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I'm sure every architect in this room would be interested in hearing, or was interested in hearing your conversation about um, the need for insulation and, and the kind of emphasis on the envelope, which seems to be the main uh, driver of a lot of current code and upgrades to code. Um, I'm curious about what you would say about um, how do you, what are you most interested in in terms of the um, public sector uh, research going on that has to do with um, industries being developed? Um, it seems to me that research is driven by money and by um, the ability for industry to take hold of something and run with it. Um, what in your mind is the most sort of, what do you feel most optimistic about in terms of the um, industrial sector and what efforts are being made that you feel um, could have real impact on climate change? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so great that I don't have a quick answer uh, for that. I, I would say that um, if there is one thing we could turn on a dime, uh, and actually easy for us to turn on a dime, it's lighting energy. Uh, you know, part of it is uh, the fact that, and, and, I, and I've been talking about this now for probably three decades, but, uh, you know, we see by contrast, uh, we don't see with absolute uh, lighting levels, we see in contrast, lighting is located in a ceiling. Uh, you could not pick a more inefficient place to get light to the eye than, than to put it in the ceiling. If we could just sort of get in there and think about how we can sort of construct what's in our view field, it's probably the one place that we could talk about an order of magnitude uh, reduction energy. I actually also had a last slide that I didn't show um, that um, was either meant to be very positive or very pessimistic, and I, I couldn't decide which it was, so I thought not to show it. But, uh, I, and I, I can imagine that certain of you he, are in here do remember the oil embargo. Uh, cities went dark. Cities were dark at night, and I had, had a, a great photo of Philadelphia actually in the mid-80s, completely dark at night. Uh, the putting lights back on, that, all that shut off during, after the oil embargo. Uh, lights were, were sort of few and far between. There would be one room that was getting cleaned. That light would be on, all the rest of the lights were off. And then slowly at the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, it'd go from a room being off to, uh, they'd go on to, they're cleaning the floor, so the lights of that one floor would be on. Now, of course, we're just sort of fully lit at night. And I was thinking about this because a few weeks ago I was in Dallas and speaking to um, a group of philanthropists there who were trying to get uh, Dallas, Houston, and Austin to go dark. Their interest is its impact on uh, bird migration patterns, as, uh, so primarily about the health of birds and their migration, that if we could just get those cities to turn off many of their lights at night, um, this would be much better for, for, for birds. But we had years when all of those lights were completely off at night, uh, with, with few exceptions. Um, we, in, in our sort of thinking about how we move forward, we sometimes avoid even, if there was a single heroic solution, it would be that. And the second piece of it would be and how the lighting industry really does completely rethink the way that not only do we sort of deal with electric light within our eye, but also uh, how we deal with uh, daylighting. We tend to over, uh, that's a whole other story. But that would be the industry that I would be um, investing money in. Hey, Michelle. Thanks for the lecture. Uh, I'm a management consultant here in New York City. I work mostly with uh, design build firms and fabricators. Um, in theory, I believe that sustainability can be reset at an academic level. However, I find it harder to believe that at a practical standpoint because of economic factors and also just efficiency uh, that it can actually be done. 
at a local level. Do you feel the same, or do you feel that we just need a reset? I think what I'm talking about a, a reset here is to actually sort of peel back to sort of have us ask better questions in terms of what we're going to focus on, where we want to have legislation, what kinds of industries should we be supporting on this. Um, I wish I could come up with a really clear response to that. Um, I don't want to say that I'm not hopeful. Uh, I, I do think that it's going to be a very, very dense mesh and network of things, uh, that some of it will be uh, within the range of how we rethink our building processes uh, at multiple kinds of levels, including the level that you're working at now. Uh, some of it will be at a complete, and it'll have to be, a complete rethinking of anything that, that we build new, particularly as we're moving into developing uh, countries. Um, we are going to have to have very, very soon um, a different type of solution for how we deal with the climate of the body, the interior environment. Those are actually possible. Like I said, the, the light thing is here today. Um, the interior climate is, there's bits and pieces of that coming together in, in many different ways. It's been great to see a uh, resurgence of interest in using radiation, which is, I mean, the good kind of radiation, um, which will uh, very much sort of challenge the need uh, to do the kind of dilution we do. We can start to see what I think are sort of these moments where things will start moving uh, in a better direction. Uh, we're going to have to completely rethink the way that we rapidly urbanize in areas, particularly in developing worlds. What does it take to house or shelter um, 60 million people outside of Cairo? Uh, what does it take to sort of house or shelter uh, the poorest of society uh, that we deal with? Uh, it's probably not in tiny homes. You know, it, it, it's, it's going to be a radically different way of thinking about how we support, how we shelter uh, large numbers of people. We can, these are the kinds of things we, we should be thinking about, we could be thinking about. Um, will we still have to geoengineer the atmosphere? Um, I don't know. Uh, will there be a miracle come about in terms of, as I read almost every day, uh, there's another device uh, that takes uh, carbon uh, out of the air. Uh, that may well happen. Um, but it does mean working on all fronts. And I think that's the only answer I can give. It's working on every single front uh, that we can think about. But I just want to, what I think, though, that is so incredible about, you know, you know, some of the things I remember, the lighting, you know, I, I still I still share always this notion of, you know, we, we should use architecture to modulate light and not just light fixtures, or we should use thickness or balconies to, uh, and, and I was thinking about, you know, Michael Pollan in the kind of food realm of saying, well, maybe, in, in a way, we don't know, but we also know there's common sense, right? If you reuse a building, well, probably it's better than building a new one. Or, uh, you know, Michael Pollan speaks about you should eat like your grandmother with maybe just five ingredients, <laughs> you know. Or, I mean, there are these, uh, you know, scale, for example, this, this idea that as an architect you could come and say, well, wh why do you need 200,000 square feet? Why do you need to grow? Why do you need to expand? Like, these are fundamental... Uh, non-technological questions that are, so it, it's this odd thing where we have so much information, so much noise, but fundamentally, uh, in, with the tools that that are so disciplinary, we could also, and I know that, I mean, for me, that's what the lecture is also saying. We should be asking these, these questions again and not be served, you know, these numbers and then just serve them back again kind of in a new way. So, I mean... Uh, I, I think this is a moment where we should be questioning. Mm -hmm. 
uh, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I especially liked your take on the Sankey diagram and how transactional it is. Um, so thank you again. Um, when our firm tackled the EUI issue and how to use it as a metric, we actually thought of energy not as an output of an energy model, but as an input to some sort of goal. For instance, if it's a university, using energy would be potentially as measured as how many citations you get per the research you do. If it's in hospital, how many patients you treat, or if you're a bank, how much more dollars you make, etc. But it gets on a slippery slope, and I think it has something to do with an unpronounced theme of your presentation, as well as your latest answer, which is that energy gets used by the wealthy more disproportionately compared to the not so fortunate. And um, whether it's the tech bros turning on Netflix at night versus the home that you showed at night that wasn't using that much per capita, um, what do you see uh, in the future as a overall reflection on the more advanced and more developed societies using more energy? Well, I mean, the uh, first part of that is I, I, I love the way that your company is thinking about sort of uh, um, what is the actual output uh, that one gains uh, from energy. I, I love that kind of thinking, and I'm actually going to, I'm borrowing that uh, uh, for that. I think that in, in terms of, you know, understanding this, the incredible inequity uh, that we deal with. And I, I think this has been a big part of what's uh, brought me back uh, to Brundtland and continues to bring me back to Brundtland was the fact that that sort of question of inequity was never lost in the UN's original work on this. Um, and it's the most important thing for me about challenging sustainability done as a thing, a unit, a property, um, a product. Because if it's sort of defined as around a thing, it will always sort of continue to favor those who have more uh, than those who have less. Uh, you know, we, we talked for years about the green premium on certain kinds of buildings. And when we look at uh, the options and even the technologies for, for those 11 or 12 homes, those were things that only those of a certain income level uh, could hope to achieve. Um, I'm, I don't know that I'm necessarily hopeful, but my, my intention would be that if we can actually reset the way it is that we analyze energy and the consumption of energy away from the unit by unit basis to something that more resembles an appropriate um, you know, atmospheric balancing, that's going to be a great equalizer within that because it will take in the incredible types of impacts that a lot of sort of very large, very expensive, uh, very materially intensive projects will have. They're, they'll They'll be dealing with the consequences of what they're doing. Right now, there's no consequences for that kind of action. Uh, if we can just begin to sort of analyze in a different way, we can start applying consequences where they belong. Um, that's a whole other set of conversation to have with legislators going forward on terms of that. But I, but I, I love how you're thinking about energy. Hi, Michelle. Um, and also, I want to thank you for a beautiful lecture is really, really thought provoking. I, I think this question builds off of the last one actually or on your comments as well. Um, I really appreciate in your talk how you, you really explicitly wanted us to look at the way models are constructed and the biases that go into the way models are framed um, and especially breaking up that question of sector-based accounting. I think for many it's a little too wonky but I think there's really, really, really important points in there. Um, so, the question I have comes back to this, this sense of abstraction mm -hmm. and biases. And I'm curious when we, um, if the primary concern we're talking about right now is climate change. And I think we would all probably agree that all energy sources or all megajoules are not the same, do not have the same contribution to climate change. Um, and as most sectors 
and most industries have moved from doing energy accounting to doing carbon accounting. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on why architects and engineers seem stuck talking about embodied energy and not talking about carbon more explicitly, and whether that is, um, is a bias that we could do without, or whether it trips us up a little bit, that extra layer of abstraction. So Stephanie, could you repeat, did you say seems why, stuck? Why Wait. talk about embodied energy and not embodied carbon, and talk about climate change? more explicitly when we have all the methods and the tools and the data um, to do so. So, so I'll, let me make sure I'm hearing this. Why are we talking about embodied chem, but or, or only embodied? So make sure I'm thinking of the right, right one here. Yeah, so all of your slides are about energy. Uh -huh. And energy efficiency and energy use, energy use intensity and energy fuel sources, uh, rather than the metric of climate change, which is uh, carbon. Well, I mean, I think a lot of this does go back uh, to this the Sokolo wedge. Um, carbon is, you know, if we think about rated forcing uh, in toto, uh, carbon's the biggest player. It's not the only player uh, within that. Uh, there are other players that are actually have greater global warming potential than carbon. There are other players that also have longer atmospheric lifetimes, and that's just talking about the greenhouse gases. It's sort of not dealing with a lot of the other features that we deal with. I think the, the biggest unknown, and, and this is a, a big unknown uh, for uh, many people who do uh, the type of um, heat transfer modeling, atmospheric heat transfer modeling, is how we're altering the radiative emission of the surfaces that we're dealing with, because that's sort of the, the key thing that you worry about. So greenhouse gases, carbon is just there to trap that, uh, but what's actually emitting uh, in long wave radiation is, is, is a great concern. So we've always been focused on albedo, uh, which is about solar reflectivity back out. But the nature of what's happening on the surface is the other piece of this. Every single energy exchange increases radiant emission. Some increase it at a low level, some increase it at a very high level. Um, this is, if, if you look at the way that radio forcing is calculated, if you look at these particular sort of like uh, energy exchanges, this is one of the most underdeveloped sort of areas in terms of modeling is understanding that. So talking about energy uh, takes into account every single energy exchange, because every energy exchange is increasing radiant emission. They all matter. Um, I'm not interested in sort of trading one for another, one type for another, uh, in order to do a little bit of good. It's sort of recognizing that uh, if we think about exergy not just from a source standpoint, sort of moving from, from low to high uh, in terms of quality, but we also think about every single energy exchange that we can eliminate. Every exchange that we can eliminate makes a difference. And we've been more concerned, the reason I stay away from carbon is not because we shouldn't be working on decarbonizing, it's that if we focus on decarbonizing, we tend to trade a different set of energy exchanges for a carbon exchange. We're still doing damage when we do that. Our entire focus within our field how many energy exchanges can I eliminate? How many energy processes can I eliminate? And I think if, as we're thinking about an architecture, that's within our power to start at that level. Still decarbonize, still absolutely go in that direction. That's operating at a higher level, but that first level has got to be how many of these do we actually turn off? Do we not have happening in the first place? Well, I think that's a, one more. Yes. Hi, Dean Addington. So good to see you up here, and thank you again for your lecture. I wanted to ask if you see yourself implementing any of the public policy um, empowerment that you've been able to have in Austin in the classical architecture curriculum at UT. Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting because we don't tend to think about any aspect like that as being a standard part of our curriculum. And actually, I, I hadn't even thought about it until you asked the question. Uh, you know, it, it comes about through 
the research groups. It comes about through the research that we do. And while students are often involved in that, thinking that maybe we need to rethink our definitions of professional practice to engage that might be a really important sort of change or addition to the curriculum. We'll start on that. Uh, I'll get back Thursday. <laughs> Let me know how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you again for the fantastic lecture. Um, I, as an educator, uh, one of the challenges that we are seeing, some of the issues that you've been highlighting is basically really looking at the primitives of what is constitute of a wall or a ceiling or all these primitives that we have been kind of taking for granted. I think that thermal boundary layer that you mentioned is a very key point, right? And even the idea of the exergy and the delta T is really, they're one, right, in environmental, like, you know, it change between inside and outside. But that has a very slow, so as soon as we're talking about um, school, like in, in any type of educational uh, setting, this type of, this is what is so fantastic about it, because in a, we, in a way we are, we are positioned to ask these fundamental questions that, ultimately require much like a longer time span to be able to investigate, rethink, test, all that. Where we are, and which I think now you're kind of like transitioning into is the policy level which we are going really in a different fast pace. And uh, for example, in New York City, we are looking at a series of codes that have been brought up. NYSERDA has been literally pulling stuff from like Europe and bringing and implementing. It's a very different. Um, type of a um, connection now is happening. So I'm wondering how you have uh, been thinking or have you been thinking about ways in which we are training the future architect but trying to negotiate these rates of uh, discussions that are happening? Well, this is, I mean, what you bring up is something that I think is um, both the kind of incredible power of, of what it is that we do and and probably one of its um, one of the the most diff difficult aspects about it uh, no matter what no no matter what we do what we think how we analyze um, you know how how we synthesize how we uh, build scenarios we still build uh, we build without the information we might want to have because we still have to build uh, no matter how I might talk about the appropriate way to do an energy analysis, we still build in units of buildings. You know, we don't build in domains of energy balances. We build in units of buildings. We always have to think about sort of like the level at which um, we take action, whether as individuals, whether as firms, uh, whether as entities, it's always going to be at that unit type of level on that. Um, energy codes have changed unbelievably rapidly. Uh, if you think about how long a plumbing code <laughs> stays, stays around for decades, uh, energy codes tend to, to turn over uh, every few years uh, throughout this country. Uh, so there is actually a will out there uh, to responding on this. Uh, uh, so understanding that we're going to continue to take action even if we don't know um, is perhaps sort of like the most important lesson that goes out there, uh, that if we understand that each one of these actions that we do take, and this is really key for our students as well, is that uh, it's what we know now. Some of it is just to get something in place as a placeholder for the next thing that should be better. I think where we go awry is when we think we, we've got the solution, and that's the thing that we want to sort of put into legislation to sort of hold it. But as long as we understand that each one of these actions might be a test, it might be a prototype, um, it might be a strategy to get us to the next level, um, I'm actually uh, even more interested and excited in understanding how those moves will be taking us in a particular direction or at the very least teaching us some hard-earned lessons and for the students as well. <laughs>
Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Amal. And thank you, too, to all of our questioners for really thoughtful questions.